whiskey tasting always brings people out. Um, this is the fifth year of the Pendarian Prize, and it's been the first one where it's been incredibly tight. There was wafer thin between 11 books. The uh, long list could have turned into the short list so easily. Five books were slightly ahead of the other six, which all tied. And um, we've never had a judge's you know, discussion before. It's always been, oh yeah, Mark Lewison has won, Daniel Rachel's won, John Sandwich has won, yeah, easily. There's not going to be any discussion at all. But this one was, oh my god, <laughs> let's go over everything again, let's not make sure there's been any mistakes. And in the end, one person won. <laughs> wow. Um, so what I'm going to do now is uh, bring on John Fragata from Penderan, and he's going to tell you who the winner is. And we'll get a very expensive whiskey and a thousand pounds. And the prestige of winning the Pendarian Prize, Joe. Thank you. Morning, all. How are you all doing? It was weary as me. Um, never rings in Lan, as we know. It's beautiful today. Uh, this is uh, Pendarian Level uh, um, sponsoring this prize. Uh, Steve, our manager, just got a bottle to Ron Sexsmith, who tweeted. Uh, about Pendarian with the grumpiest face he's ever pulled and he's, he's quite a grumpy guy and, um, and we are mixing with uh, rock and roll uh, royalty these days uh, we had a lovely tweet of a bottle of Pendarian from Kylie Minogue last week which was, uh, which was great um, and all, all my job is here today is to announce the uh, winner of the Pendarian Music Book Prize of 2019 and the winner is Shirley Collins means to me. And sitting here, I... <laughs> Where's the whiskey? Where's the whiskey? <laughs> oh, it's in a wooden box. I know I'm very old. <laughs> I understand now how people get confused when they're making speeches at the Oscars and they've won an Oscar. <laughs> this, is, this is incredible. Um, I was here in this room, I think six years ago, um, doing a programme about America Over the Water, which was my first book. And I haven't written one of those since, and um, all of the it took me, I think, five years to write, because there was so much to try and get in it. I was evacuated during the war to Clenethley, um, just down the coast, for three months, so I sort of felt a, a bit of a kinship with Larne as well. Um, such a lovely place it is. I just feel fortunate that throughout my life I've just been sustained by books and music. I remember as a child, you know, the greatest thrill on a Saturday when you were out of school was to be able to get down to the library on a Saturday morning and choose your new book, um, even though I have to confess it was Malcolm Savile, Richmond Crompton, all the William books, and I have to confess one or two Enid Blyton's as well, but <laughs> later on of course my taste improved as I grew up. <laughs> I had an MBE a few years ago as well, I was given an MBE by Prince Charles at Buckingham Palace. I have to say truthfully, this means more to me. Um, because of my <laughs> my book and not for sort of generalisation and they don't even give you a cup of tea at the palace <laughs> that's a, a 300 pound or is it 300 years old that's 300 pounds <laughs> bottle of whiskey which somebody said to me would ensure that I get really good sleeps for the next 10 years <laughs> so um, obviously there are people to thank um, the judges who although I was a struggle and only one of my whisker um, Put me through finally, and to my and to you know, all the team here at the Lawn Festival, 
such lovely people to meet, and um, to my publisher, of course, Mark Pilkington of Strange Attractor Press, who over those five years proved incredibly patient um, all through the whole process. I don't know what else to say to you because I'm slightly overwhelmed, and for once, I don't know if you know Pickwick Papers very well, the character Jingle in it, who is always garrulous and can't stop talking. And then when he's given something wonderful, I think it's his fair to Australia by Mr. Pickwick, he says, for once, no words. <laughs> and I have almost run out of what I want to say to you, but I'm looking forward to doing the Q&A because once I get, you know, you, I can launch back um, to questions and... <laughs> I could cry really, but I've forgotten my hanky, so <laughs> thank you so much. Good afternoon everyone. It's my <coughs> uh, great pleasure to introduce the uh, titan of English folk music and uh, now winner of the 2019 Penderen <coughs> Prize for the Best Music Book of the Year. I'd like to welcome Shirley Collins. <laughs> and I'm really delighted that Shirley's book has won the prize. It's been, you know, it's been one of the most heartwarming uh, music stories of recent years. Shirley's return to sing after a very long time when she was unable to sing, not unwilling, but just literally unable to sing. And with this triumphant return with the film, The Ballad of Shirley Collins, and the album, Lodestar. And it's, you know, it's wonderful to see someone who's, I think it's fair to say, work has really been undervalued for a very long time, getting her due. And this, All in the Downs, is just a wonderful book about a vanishing, but still strangely resistant world. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Hastings, um, on the East Coast, South East Coast, of course, um, into a family. Oh, it's an interesting, well, yes, curious family. Uh, but I was, so I was born in 1935, so I was four when war broke out. And we were evacuated twice from Hastings, once to Welling Garden City. That's my sister Dolly and me. And then we <coughs> spent three months in Clenethley as well, um, where we stayed with Aunt Mags, and that's the only way I remember her, and she was an aunt to a Welsh woman, Gwyneth, that my Uncle Robin had married. So I have a nice little connection just down the coast. Um, and what I really remember about that time was that there was no ice cream, no lollipops, no sweets, nothing in the war, and yet at Lenethley they had managed to make some ice lollies on sticks, little sort of cone-shaped things, and we were so thrilled to find them. The only disappointment was that after one suck, all the flavour was gone. <laughs> <laughs> so, so back to Hastings. Um, a lovely childhood. I grew up with a mother who... Um, I suppose it started earlier than that. During the war um, in Hastings, when we were still there, we stayed at Granny and Granddad's house, and they had one of those indoor Morrison shelters that were sort of steel tables with wire mesh all around the sides, so that that's supposed to protect you from whatever was landing on your house. And during that time, Granny and Granddad would sing to my sister and me as we lay there at night, listening to the bombs and watching plaster fall down off the ceilings and things. And it wasn't until a while later that I realised that what Grandad was singing, his Grandad especially, were folk songs, were English folk songs. Um, Granny liked musical stuff more, uh, but so we listened to some of that as well. But it was Grandad's sort of gentle, straightforward Sussex voice singing these old songs that gave us a feeling of comfort and protection and safety. And I carried that that with me all my life, um, that the way to sing the songs is the way that Grandad sang them, just straightforwardly, you know, not dramatising them, not dressing them up. And that really stood me in good stead when I went on to listen to other field recordings of old Sussex singers who sang in that same way, that same direct way. Mm. How much do you hear folk song then after that, when you were growing up? Well, it's a bit. Um, my sister 
we, Dolly and I were interested in, in the music we heard. And on the radio at that time, there was a program um, called, there were two programs called Country Magazine and As I Roved Out. Um, and on one of them, they had people singing English folk songs, uh, some of which were accompanied, uh, you know, baritone singing accompaniment accompanied by pianos, and it just didn't sound right to me. And then there were one or two field recordings of, of proper country folk um, singing, and that just sounded right to me. So we were so keen on this music that um, Dolly brought a guitar that she didn't know how to play, so she just laid it across her knee and sort of strummed it like a zither, and we thought that was a brilliant way to accompany ourselves. But that, sorry, back to the music question. So Dolly and I um, used to sing occasionally when we were sort of 15, 16 at um, socialist get-togethers um, at a, a big uh, Edwardian house on the Ridge at Hastings uh, where we were the entertainment. I mean, only in small spots, of course, because nobody would want to listen to two 15-year-olds for a whole evening. Um, so that was, that was our first grounding in singing in public. When did you start to think that might be something you were going to take seriously? <laughs> well, it's not a serious answer, actually, because, um, yes, we went to the library in the morning, and then in the lunchtime, Mum would give us ten bob, and we'd go into Lion's Corner House and dried up baked beans um, for lunch, and then we'd go to the pictures in the afternoon, and in those days, you could stay through for as many performances of the film as you wanted, you know, you didn't get turfed out after the first showing. And they also had B movies as well as the big A movie. And we saw one movie, one B movie called Nightclub Girl, which is the story of a girl in the Tennessee mountains who went <coughs> to a, a sort of plane crash that nobody was killed in luckily, um, that had a talent scout from New York on board. And he took shelter in the house of these people in the Tennessee mountains. And this girl was singing to uh, oh, she had a harp, I think, which is a bit unlikely for Tennessee. Um, it doesn't happen that often there. And he was so entranced by her that he took her off to New York um, to sing her folk songs in nightclubs. And she was dressed in such pretty frocks then. I thought, oh, that's for me. I'm going to be a folk singer. <laughs> Literally. You know, that's <laughs> what 15-year-olds were like in those days. Great. And uh, not that long afterwards, you, you made the move to London, which was quite a thing to do, surely, at that time. Yes, it was. I mean, I'd, oh, the other thing about um, folk singing as well, uh, the, uh, when I decided I wanted to be a folk singer, I wrote to the BBC to let them know. <laughs> <laughs> I'd only been to London twice up to the age of 18. People just didn't travel in those days, you know. Um, we did, the furthest travel we ever did was the mystery coach tours that you could catch from the seafront at Hastings and they would generally wind through the countryside and end up at a pub. Um, and that was fine, but I hadn't travelled. And yet, I decided to go, I had to go to teacher's training college for a year because my mum, who believed in education for women as well, and my headmistress thought I ought to go and be a school teacher, I lasted a year at that teacher's training college because it wasn't what I wanted. I wanted to be a singer. And so I came home, worked as a bus conductress for the summer, and then took myself up to London to find books, mostly. It was books I was keen to find, books of folk songs, because there weren't many recordings at that time, not that I knew about. Um, so off I went and used to sing with a group of other people at sing-arounds at um, Cecil Sharp House and at London University, where the couple of people who were keen on letting young people sing, we all sat around in a circle and had one song each. And um, that was it, and I started my life in London that way. After a little while in London, you, um, you did some work with the theatre workshop with uh, Joan Littlewood, the great theatre practitioner, and of course her husband, the um, important folk singer, <laughs> or indeed infamous, um, uh, Ewan McColl. Um, can you tell us a little bit about meeting Joan and Ewan? Well, Joan was terrifying. Um, I, I met her I, I, just by chance because um, there was another folk singer, um, Isla Cameron, who was an actress as well, and she was booked to appear in a play that Ewan had written, a musical play that was going to be taken over to the Warsaw Peace Festival. 
and she was ill, so I got suggested and I got the job because there's basically nobody else to do it. And I, I made a disaster of it because I couldn't act, you know, I didn't know how to move on stage or anything, and, um, and Joan was quite terrifying. <coughs> and then Ian, uh, Ewan was equally terrifying, but in a different way. Um, he knew how much I wanted to look at as many books as I possibly could. And he invited me out to his house in South Croydon to see his library. And I stepped through the door and he was undressing. <laughs> so it was obviously his etching so I was there to see and not the books at all. Um, <laughs> and that slightly coloured my, my view of him. But I had always found him when I heard him sing, because so I was used to people singing like Grandad sang or like the one or two traditional singers that were, you know, being brought up to London for us youngsters to listen to, people like Harry Cox and George Maynard, who sang just pretty much like my granddad did, and it was music I understood and loved. And Ewan would swing his chair around, you know, sit astride it, one hand behind his ear, and then go on with the song, and I thought, oh God, this is so pretentious, you know, <laughs> as indeed it was. And he didn't like anybody either. Um, so I thought, no, I don't like you either, you know. Um, so I, I, the thing was, he was always very keen on telling people how to sing. It was, and, and, but he was, he was not real himself. He, you know, it was a, a self-made, self-designed person, singer. Um, you know, Jimmy Miller was his real name. He became Ewan McCall. And it all seemed so utterly phony to me and so unpleasant as well. They're, they're, some rather nasty happenings um, for other people too. But that was me, and, but I, and it, even so, I still managed to get through to through this play and, and get to Russia and to Warsaw as well, and uh, do my bit, and I sang in the Kremlin. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing you and McCall did do for you, I guess, was through him that you met Alan Lomax, the Tell us a little bit about meeting Alan Lomax. Well, yes, I mean, Ewan was throwing a party for Alan, and, and I knew about Alan because um, I'd heard various broadcasts of his on the, on the radio. Um, and his programmes were actually directed by a young David Attenborough. Oh. Um, and I met David a few years ago at one of the BBC <coughs> Folk Awards ceremonies. And, reminded, and he reminded me of the time that he and Alan had brought Margaret Barry, the great Irish gypsy singer, to London to appear on television on one of their programmes. And apparently the producers just came down and chastised them both because they brought over this wild, toothless Irish gypsy, you know, to inflict on the public. And David remembered this with, with sort of some affection and some glee. <laughs> And what did you make of Alan when you, when you first came across him? I have to tell it, every time it's the same because I knew, I mean, I was really interested in his work anyway and I was thrilled to meet him. But the minute I set eyes on him, I fell in love. He looked just like he was a big Texan, tall, burly man with big shoulders and a head of shaggy dark hair, and he reminded me of an American bison. <laughs> <laughs> My favourite animal. <laughs> And I just fell in love on the spot. I mean, I think it must have been partly because I was so thrilled to have met him, and this man who sort of recorded and collected all this marvellous music. I mean, not only from America, but also from the British Isles and from Franco's fascist Spain as well in the 50s, which was a dangerous undertaking, and from Italy. And so I admired him, but there it was. He was in his 40s and I was sort of 20. And there it was, couldn't do anything about it. You know what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> after you broke up, well, after he went back to the States, just beforehand, he, you made your first two full-length records with Alan. Well, yes, I did. Um, Alan and I were together, I think, for about four years, because I moved in with him fairly soon after I met him. God knows what my mum thought. Um, <laughs> and, but we worked, there was lots of work to do. I mean, most of the work I did for him was... Um, helping to put together his, his great volume, The Folk Songs of North America, which Castle were publishing at the time. And I think I assumed, well, he, he finally got homesick. He'd been away for a long time. 
Um, and he partly left the States to escape from the American Unactivities Committee um, because he was on their list. And he came over here to work, but ended up in fascist Spain as well, you know, under the heel of Franco. And he also always said that the Guardia Civil were like black crows looming on the horizon, you know, keeping an eye on everything. So after four years together, he decided he had to go back to America and he was going to go alone. And I was heartbroken. Um, and the day he left, my mum and I went to see him off on the boat train at Waterloo Station. And then to cheer me up, mum took me to the pictures in Leicester Square to see Attila the Hun. <laughs> <laughs> Sophia Lauren and Anthony <laughs> Quinn, and then she took me, gave me a box of chocolates, and put me to bed with an oh. aspirin. Oh. It's the days of simple remedies. <laughs> but a few, oh yes, and, that, and I think Alan and Peter Kennedy asked me, I mean, told me um, that they were going to record all the songs I knew. Some of which were songs I'd learned from home, and a great many from Cecil Sharp's book of folk songs for schools which we, we had learned at school. And so I recorded all these, I mean, not, not the best quality songs, certainly, but they recorded two albums worth. Um, and I think it was Alan's way of saying sorry, you know, um, here's a little present for you. And when I hear those albums nowadays, they're still on sale. And it's, it's quite dreadful, because I sound so incredibly young, and I was playing an auto harp on some of them and I was an incredibly high little voice, and I sound so naive, but it's what I was, you know, it's how I was then. Um, and in a way, it's sort of sweet to look back on it. A really major leap forward, I guess, in your music making was when you started working with your sister Dolly. My sister, yes. Um, and I don't know why it didn't happen sooner than it did, but Dolly was always quite shy, and she didn't really like performing in public. But she had trained um, in her earlier years um, at the World <coughs> Music Association in Paddington under the composer <coughs> Alan Bush, and the composition was what she wanted to do. And for some reason it hadn't occurred to her. I mean, I was playing a guitar and a five-string banjo and a dulcimer that I had brought back from America. And they were sort of basic, because I, I just couldn't play very well, but they were basic and they were sort of pleasant enough under the songs, but I just felt that the songs deserved a lot more, you know, better instrumentation and accompaniment that, um, that they'd had so far. And Dolly, I, Dolly and I used to go um, to the Early Music Association in London, because that was another f uh, form of music that I loved, and we'd listen to their rehearsals, and it was there we met David Munro, <coughs> who was at that time working with Michael Morrow's Musica Reservata, but he was soon to form his own early music consort. And Dolly wrote, um, well, John and I put together a suite of songs that we called Anthems in Eden. You made one of the, you know, the very first kind of folk rock, electric folk records, No Roses, and that was with um, Ashley Hutchings. That was Ashley and about 28 other musicians in the studio, and people like Richard Thompson, Simon Nicol, John Kirkpatrick, um, Dave Mattox. They all came into the studio in um, sort of a few at a time in Chelsea. And then the music was, was just getting so exciting that they all said, can we stay, can we stay, can we play on a bit more, you know. And, and the whole thing finally had these 24 wonderful musicians on. And again, people do say to me, yeah, but it was electric. It wasn't folk music, it was, you know, electric. But the songs were traditional songs and very great songs, some of them. Um, and so nothing changed as far as I was concerned, but, you know, for the listener, um, they did. I remember, I mean, none of the early albums I made went down well with people like you and Nicole and Bert Lloyd. And um, I remember you and wrote, in one of the magazines, he wrote something like, when, when I was working with David Graham, he said, this jujube, her jujube's notes slithering from her mouth. Um, and it was just horribly likened me to a bucolic cow, Jersey cow, lumbering along, and then finished the whole thing with, and, and nimble-fingered Davy carries her along, the Lady Baden power of English song. And what's that all about? Who did you have to put up with? 
Uh, well, we, we wear the scorned man, I guess. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I, I think he'd for, long forgotten that. Um. Well, tell us a little bit about Ashley Hutchings and how you met and then. Uh, well, it was after we'd recorded um, Anthems in Eden, which has its final song that John Marshall wrote, um, The Ladies Go Dancing at Whitson. It's 51 springtime since she was a bride, and still you may see her at each Whitson tide in a dress of white linen and ribbons of green, as green as her memories of loving. The feet that were nimble tread carefully now, as gentle a measure as age do allow, through groves of white blossom and fields of young corn, where once she was pledged to her true love. And that was, of course, a First World War song. I mean, it was initially a really creative relationship with Ashley Hutchings. Oh, so it was Ashley. Oh, that's <laughs> what, so that's what reminded me of that. Ashley, I hadn't met him. I'd heard of um, Fairport Convention, and I'd heard Legion Leaf, which I thought was a lovely album. But I hadn't met Ashley. And um, one day I had a phone call from him um, saying that he really loved anthems, and he liked what I said about the ladies who danced, you know, still kept dancing, although they'd lost their sweethearts and all in the First World War. And he, I, he said, oh, and you, I see you're at Cecil Sharp House at the end of the week. Would you mind if I came along? And I didn't mind at all. You know, I, I said, no, by all means, and not thinking any more about it. And then it was another of those coups de food, you know, when you've just fallen off on the spot. And it seemed to be quite mutual as well, which is lovely. Um, and then we started seeing each other, and by that time I was divorced from Austin John Marshall, you know, two or three years later. And then Ashley and I um, moved down to, back to Sussex, because I was living in London at the time, and I really <coughs> didn't want to be there much longer. So we rented a cottage in Etchingham in London, uh, in um, Etchingham, yes, Red Rose it was called, and uh, we had a sort of idyllic life there for quite a while. Mm. And, uh, I mean, there were several records, and then the extensive collaboration with uh, theatre works like uh, Lark Rice to Candleford. And yeah. No, I mean, Ashley and I made, uh, we did make it, and uh, at this point, well, Ashley had sort of discovered Morris dancing and made Morris on and Son of Morris on great records, and uh, the dance band as well, where people for the first time danced to electric traditional music, you know, the traditional tunes, and it was just fantastic. People would just soar onto the, the floor and, and dance away. And uh, we'd been together seven years, and then the National Theatre um, asked Ashley if he would provide the music for their production of Lark Rise to Candleford. And we went along, and I was in the band, it was still the Albion band playing, but it was at this point that Ashley fell in love with an actress, younger than me, so it wasn't as if he was changing me for a younger model, as they always say. Um, and one night he came home and said, I'm leaving in the morning. And I was so shocked. I mean, I, it, was, it was just, yeah, it was just a shock. And, I, I, and then he went, and that was it. I'll just finish this off by, because, you know, for, you know, after that, you know, gradually, you just retired from the scene. Yes, I mean, my voice just wasn't secure. Some, as I say, sometimes I could sing, and I was still trying to persevere with it. But I, I couldn't, I just completely lost my nerve, and I thought, no, whatever reputation I had as a singer, I was just ruining it by singing so badly or so unreliably in public. And it took a sort of two or three, four years to wind down, but I was just getting more and more humiliated by singing so badly and not ever knowing whether I could or not, and uh, could or not. And it was just terrifying, finally. So I eventually just had to give up, and because I've got my two kids to bring up, and no money from Ashley, um, which was OK, because they weren't with children anyway. But um, I, had to, I had to find jobs to, you know, to keep us going. And I, the first job I took was as a char, because that was great. I could clean a country house and come home with 20 quid at the end of the day, you know, which was brilliant. What finally? brought you back to singing? Do you know, I, I mean, I, it was partly that I was listening to other people sing, and the, the, 
the way the folk scene was going, a lot of people were writing their own songs and calling it folk songs, and they're not. You know, you can't write a folk song. It's had to really undergo that that travel through the generations and sometimes centuries um, and passed on by word of mouth. You can't write one of those. Um, and I'm minded that people were passing this off as folk music. And then a lot of people were sort of dramatizing songs ever so much. You know, there was, there was a new voice for women that was either very strident if they were feminists or if they were not, they were very sort of mousy singers. Or sometimes the feminists writing their own songs and calling themselves feminists, they, they were singing like little orphans, you know. <laughs> and I thought, I'd better go and show them. <laughs> <laughs> not, not quite as broad as that, but no, I mean, that did sort of trigger something that I wanted to, I just wanted to get back and be Shirley Collins again rather than what I'd become. Thank you, that's a great note to end on. <laughs> Shirley's book, her wonderful book, is for sale at the back and she will surely sign copies for you. But now just thank you very much, yes, Shirley. Thank you. Thank you.